Okay. Let's get back to Mark. Gospel according to Mark. You notice I don't say Saint Mark. Not that he's not a saint. But who are saints? All Christians. So, <laughs> All right. See, I, I, I stay away from calling the people in the Bible saints as if we are not. Okay? Mark is a believer in Christ just like we are. We are saints like he is. So if I call him Saint Mark, then I would call all you Saint whatever, you know, Saint Rachel. Okay? That's right. Yeah. It's not that I don't believe that. It's just that it would be very repetitive. I kept saying that every time. So uh, it's Mark. Mark, our fellow saint, fellow believer in Christ Jesus, inspired uh, through the Apostle Peter, we feel, the inspired apostle to write down what we have here preserved for us so miraculously down through the centuries. Just to give you a quick review uh, of where we're at here, we're going to start in verse 40 since we haven't visited this in a few weeks. Uh, if, if there were paragraphs, this would be the beginning of a paragraph, a new subject. Uh, verse 40, And there came a leper to him, meaning Jesus, beseeching Jesus and kneeling down to Jesus and saying unto Jesus, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 41, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. Okay, we've looked at this already, as you recall. And... Uh, You'll note Jesus in verse 41 does not pray to God to heal this leper as we would do because Jesus is God himself and just simply willing it, it happens. Only God can do that. Uh, no angel can do that. No human being can do that. No other created thing can do that. Only God can create. Only God can, can heal and cleanse. Jesus is here proving he is God. I will. I will. We pray to God for temporal things, if it be thy will. Well, we're praying to Jesus, too. If it be thy will. Just like the leper says to Jesus in verse 40. So it's one of those little, little things you see all through the Bible that point to Jesus as God the Son. Uh, he doesn't need to pray to God. He is God. And immediately what he wills happens. As it says in verse 42, it is immediate and it is complete that this terrible disease that had eaten this man uh, so ferociously into his terminal illness is immediately gone. Uh, he has immediately perfect health. Any tissue that had fallen off of him in his leprosy was immediately restored, uh, probably as pure as a little baby's skin. And uh, can you imagine how he would have felt? Uh, he's facing certain death. Now he is fully alive again and cleansed of all his sickness. And Jesus does this because he's moved with compassion, as it says in verse 41. Jesus, God is compassionate. We're told this all through the Bible. God is love. Uh, we're told that Jesus knows our, our weaknesses. He knows our troubles. He knows all that... Uh, we're under here in the sinful world. 
and he has compassion upon us. Not just physical sicknesses, but uh, our mental anguish uh, in a sinful world. He lived in this sinful world as a man too. And, and he knows what we go through here. And he has compassion. It's uh, very comforting to know, isn't it, that we have a compassionate creator, not a, a mean creator, not one who is just eager to uh, be angry with us and, and vent his wrath upon us. Uh, but he, he wants us, the Bible says, he would have all men to be saved. It's uh, one aspect of his attributes. Now we're going to run into another one of his attributes in the next verse. Because we will also see the other side of Jesus. After he heals the man, he then gives him orders, commandments. And he does this very strictly. Uh, I'm not going to say angry, but he, he lays down the law to this man. So there's that side of God, too, that we must also remember. That he doesn't give his commandments lightly. That he means them to be obeyed. And to not obey God is the worst thing you can do. So here in this account of healing this leper, we see, you might say, the emotional Jesus. We see some emotions coming out of him. So here he is. Uh, he says at the end of verse 41, I will. Just like he created the universe with one word. Let there be. And there was. He's God, the same God in the beginning with God the Father and God the Holy Ghost, Spirit of God. And uh, as he created all things, he can recreate all things and he can heal all things. So we get to verse 43. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately, uh, that's verse 42, uh, the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And in verse 43, and he straightly, and that's the same as immediately, this all happens very quickly, uh, immediately and straightly. But straightly means more than just immediately or quickly, as we're going to see in a moment. He straightly charged him and forthwith sent him away. Okay, here we see what happens after God cleanses us. He doesn't just say, you're forgiven, everything's fine, now go do anything you want to do whatever you feel like doing, does he? You're free to go. No. Straightly. Now, as you all know, this was originally inspired by the Holy Ghost in the Greek language. It was written in the Greek language, of which we have thousands of manuscripts of this, and, and we know what it says. We know what the Holy Ghost wrote. We translated this uh, in the King James here from the Greek into the English. So let's go back and look at the Greek word here, the original word, and see what it meant. And what it meant was sternly. He was stern. He was compassionate. Before he healed him, and after he healed him, he is stern. He is strict. He is severe. He is, he is almost threatening, is what this word means. Is it straightly the word he's talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. That's, yeah, well, it's translated here straightly. Okay. The original Greek word means threateningly. It's like, it's like a father with a child. I love you. I want the best for you, but I'm warning you, <laughs> you know. I want you to do this. Every one of us had parents that did that, right? They could get stern with us. Doesn't mean they didn't love us. 
but they, they meant it. And they wanted us to know they meant it seriously. And that's that tone that Jesus takes here now in this Greek word, okay? So it's kind of a contrast with verse 41 that we're running into here. The word straightly uh, meant this back, you know, in 1610 when this was translated into English in the uh, King James. Straightly meant this. Uh, A father would sometimes speak straightly to his child. And the people back then knew what that meant. Oh, he's getting very stern here. He's getting very stern. Uh, so maybe we kind of lost some of that meaning today. Yeah, well, I don't know. But uh, somebody has a way of getting that, uh, that'd be good to know. But then you have to answer, why this change with Jesus? From compassion to stern to uh, strictness. Because that's how he treats us all. Yeah, he has enough compassion to heal us, even dying in our place, our death, paying our hell. He loves us more than anything we can imagine. He wants the best for us. But at the same time, he speaks sternly to us, and we must understand that too. The Bible contains both, like you have on the board, long gospel. And they are both equally important. And they both come from God. So, he's now going to straightly charge the man, or command the man. And he means the man to listen very carefully and obey it to the letter. Now why? Why does Jesus now speak this way to this healed leper? Well, many of Jesus' miracles, not all of them, but many of them were performed in public. And being performed in public, as we've seen earlier in chapter 1 here, what would immediately happen? That's right. People talk. People talk. They've been given the gift of speech by God, and people would witness these public healings of Jesus, these miracles, And they would immediately go out and talk about it to their friends, neighbors, relatives, whatever. Uh, And this would cause what to happen then? What would be the result of people hearing about Jesus? Yeah, he'd become famous, what we call fame. And that's the word used here in verse 28, if you recall. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region around about Galilee. Why? Because these miracles he was performing. So that's what usually happened. Uh, But here, Jesus goes on to say in verse 44 to this healed leper, verse 44, he saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, But go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. He tells them about the what? The law. Very good, Terry. Yeah, the law. The law of Moses. Now, Moses' it wasn't really Moses' law. It was whose law? God's law. Moses was God's chosen instrument to write it down. Ten Commandments on stone. Uh, All the other ceremonial and political laws uh, that were to govern the nation of Israel until the Messiah came. But that's why Jesus uh, charges him in verse 40. He charges him strictly with the law. 
And he says, see thou say nothing to any man. Just the opposite of what this man would have likely do, would, would have likely have done, right? I mean, this is something, his whole life now has changed. He was close to death, now he's perfectly healthy. You think he's going to talk to people about this? Well, sure. That's right. He, it, the first thing he'll want to do is go home. First thing he'll want to do is go to his family and his, his neighbors and get back to his life that he had lost. And because of that, Jesus now says, no, no, I don't want you to do that. Uh, because there's something more important than that. And what is it? Well, that's important, certainly. Part of that is the law of God. He says, you've got to obey the law of God first. Before you do what you want to do, you must obey the law of God. And the law of God says, first thing you must do if you're healed of leprosy is to do what? Go to the priest and do this, this, and this. Now we're going to look at this law of Moses. Okay? Jesus is reminding him, hey, this law is still in effect. And this law is from God. And it's more important than you going back and rejoining your family right away and telling everybody. The most important thing you can do now is obey the law of God. And he's very strict and stern about this. This isn't a joke. This isn't uh, an option. It's like your father telling you, now you never do that again. You know, when you and you disobeyed. So let's go back and look at the law he's now referring to in the Old Testament. Let's go back to Leviticus. Third book of the Bible, book of Moses. And we'll start in chapter 13. Because this is going to take up two full chapters. I mean, this isn't just a verse or two. God had a lot to say about leprosy here. Leviticus 13, we'll start uh, in verse 1. Everybody have it? Okay, here we go. And the Lord, Jehovah, spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, like the plague of leprosy. We don't know yet if it's leprosy or not, is what it's saying. Then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priests. And the priest shall look on the plague on the skin of the flesh, and when the hair uh, in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. A priest is the one who announces this, who diagnoses this. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh and in the sight, and in sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that hath the plague seven days. He'll be quarantined, okay? Doesn't quarantine the whole community, just this one guy, okay? Verse 5, And the priest shall look on him the seventh day and see if it's progressed. And behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay, and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. And the priest shall look on him again the seventh day, and behold, if a plague be somewhat dark, and the plague spread not in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It's not leprosy. It is but a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But the scab spread much abroad in the skin, after that he hath been seen of the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen of the priest again. And if the priest see that, behold, the scab spreadeth in the skin, 
then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. Everybody following this so far? That you know how God is getting very specific here, isn't he? Verse 9. When the plague of leprosy is in a man, then he shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall see him, and behold, if the rising be white in the skin, and it have turned the hair white, and there be quick raw flesh in the rising, it is an old leprosy in the skin of his flesh, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean, and shall not shut him up, for he is unclean. And if a leprosy break out abroad in the skin, and the leprosy cover all the skin of him, that hath the plague from his head even to his foot, wheresoever the priest looketh. Then the priest shall consider, and behold, if the leprosy have covered all his flesh, he shall pronounce him clean. That hath the plague, it is all turned white, he is clean. But when raw flesh appeareth in him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall see the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean, it is a leprosy. Or if the raw flesh turn again and be changed unto white, he shall come unto the priest, and the priest shall see him, and behold, if the plague be turned into white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean, that hath the plague, he is clean. The flesh also in which even in the skin thereof was a boil, and is healed, and in the place of the boil there be a white rising, or a bright spot, white and somewhat reddish, and it be showed to the priest. And if, when the priest seeth it, behold, it be in the sight lower than the skin, and the hair thereof be turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a plague of leprosy broken out of the boil. But if the priest look on it, and behold, there be no white hairs therein, and if it be not lower than the skin, but be somewhat dark, then the priest shall shut him up seven days. And if it spread much abroad... In the skin, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean, it is a plague. But if the bright spot stay in his place and spread not, it is a burning boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Or if there be any flesh in the skin whereof there is a hot burning, and the quick flesh that burneth have a white, bright spot, somewhat reddish or white, then the priest shall look upon it. And behold, if the hair in the bright spot be turned white, and it be in sight deeper than the skin, it is a leprosy broken out of the burning, wherefore the priest shall pronounce him unclean, it is the plague of leprosy. And if the priest look on it, and behold, there be no white hair in the bright spot, and it be no lower than the other skin, but be somewhat dark, then the priest shall shut him up seven days, and the priest shall look upon him the seventh day, and if it be spread much abroad in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the plague of leprosy. And if the bright spot stay in his place, and spread not in the skin, but it be somewhat dark, it is a rising of the burning, and the priest shall pronounce him clean, or it is an inflammation of the burning. If a man or woman have a plague upon the head or the beard, then the priest shall see the plague, and behold, if it be in sight deeper than the skin, and there be in it a yellow thin hair, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a dry skull, even a leprosy upon the head or beard. And if the priest look on the plague of the skull, and behold, it be not in sight deeper than the skin, and that there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall shut him up, shall Shut up him that hath the plague of the skull seven days. And in the seventh day the priest shall look on the plague, and behold, if the skull spread not, and there be in no yellow hair, and the skull be not in sight deeper than the skin, he shall be shaven. But the skull shall he not shave. And the priest shall shut him up that hath the skull seven days more. And in the seventh day the priest shall look on the skull, And behold, if the skull be not spread in the skin, nor be in sight deeper than the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the skull spread much in the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall look on him, and behold, if the skull be spread in the skin, 
the priest shall not seek for yellow hair, he is unclean. But if the skull be in his sight at a stay, and that there is black hair grown up therein, the skull is healed, he is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. If a man also or a woman have in the skin of their flesh bright spots, even white bright spots, then the priest shall look. And behold, if the bright spots in the skin of their flesh be darkish white, it is a freckled spot that groweth in the skin, he is clean. And the man whose hair is fallen off his head, he is bald, yet he is clean. And he that hath his hair fallen off from the part of his head toward his face, he is forehead bald, yet, he, yet is he clean. And if there be in that bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish in his bald head or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy approacheth, or I mean appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean, his plague is in his head. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean, he shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. The garment also that the plague of leprosy is in, whether it be a woolen garment or a linen garment, whether it be in the warp or woof of linen or of woolen, whether in a skin or in anything made of skin, and if the plague be greenish or reddish in the garment or in the skin, either in the warp or in the woof, or in anything of skin, it is a plague of leprosy, and shall be showed unto the priest. The priest shall look upon the plague, and shut up uh, it that hath the plague seven days, and he shall look on the plague on the seventh day. If the plague be spread in the garment, either in the warp, or in the woof, or in a skin, or in any work that is made of skin, the plague is a fretting leprosy. In other words, it's an active leprosy, it is unclean. You shall therefore burn that garment, whether warp or woof, in woolen or in linen, or anything of skin wherein the plague is, for it is a fretting leprosy, it shall be burnt in the fire. And if the priest shall look, and behold, the plague be not spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, or in anything of skin, then the priest shall command that they wash the thing wherein the plague is, and he shall shut it up seven days more. And the priest shall look on the plague, after that it is washed, and behold, if the plague have not changed his color, and the plague be not spread, it is unclean, thou shalt burn it in the fire, it is fret inward, whether it be bare within or without. And if the priest look, and behold, the plague be somewhat dark after the washing of it, then he shall rend it out of the garment, or out of the skin, or out of the warp, or out of the woof. And if it appear still in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof or in anything of skin, it is a spreading plague. Thou shalt burn that wherein the plague is with fire. And the garment, either warp or woof or whatsoever thing of skin it be, which thou shalt wash, if the plague be departed from them, then it shall be washed the second time and shall be clean. This is the law of the plague of leprosy in a garment, of woolen or linen, either in the warp or woof or anything of skins, to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Yes, yeah, the weaving of the crossing of the strands of cloth. This is probably the only time you're going to read this, so I'm going to, I'm going to read it to you. Because this is what we call, uh, you might call it ceremonial law or political law. This was to rule the people of Israel until the Messiah came. But it's in the Bible. It's all inspired of God through Moses. Okay. 
Well, yes, uh, that's why they were to be quarantined. Uh, this particular sickness was contagious. How contagious, we don't know. But this was God's command. We're not really to question it as to why. He said to do it, so we do it. And that's the point Jesus is going to make with this healed leper. Uh, but this is law. As you're reading through the Bible, this, this is what you, you would see as law. But not the law that applies to us today after the Messiah has come the first time. Susceptible, yeah, yeah, yeah. They could, uh, they could, in, in examining the person, perhaps get uh, the leprosy themselves. But it goes on in chapter fourteen, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, "This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing." Okay, now this applies to the man that we just read about in Mark, right? And it's called the law uh, here of the Lord. The law of the leper in the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought unto the priest. Does it say he shall go home and tell everybody first? No. Three. And the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look and behold if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop, and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. Now, a lot of people would read and say, why is God commanding such stuff like this? What would you say to them? That's right. That's right. That's right. And this is all through the Old Testament this symbolic foreshadowing of the coming Savior who would shed his blood. So every time you read of a sacrifice in the Old Testament, it was to remind the people of that one in whom they hoped, that promised seed of the woman. This was their faith. Now, we don't need it today because we're looking back and we see Jesus has already come. We have a great advantage in that regard. They didn't know when he would come, or even if he would come. We now know he has come. What a great advantage that is to us. So we don't need the, the symbolism uh, of these sacrifices. But you can see it's very important to God. Now, where did this healing come from? It came from God, and uh, they sacrifice as a thank offering to God and as a reminder of the coming cleansing of sin. Uh, verse 7, and he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. 8, and he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean and after that he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his tent seven days. Okay? So only after he has seen the priest and is pronounced cleansed and gone through these other rituals is he allowed to go home. Nine, but it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. Even all his hair he shall shave off and he shall wash his clothes. Also he shall wash his flesh in water and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two he lambs without blemish. Why without blemish? Yeah. It's foreshadowing the Messiah who is perfect and without sin. He doesn't take his sickest uh, lamb uh, because that's his least, you know, least loss to him, but his, his, most, his best lamb. 
He gives his best to God as God gives his best to us. And one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, and three-tenth deals of fine flour for a meat offering uh, mingled with oil and one log of oil. And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, or the, the temple in Jesus' day, not the tabernacle. And the priest shall take one he lamb and offer him for a trespass offering and the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall slay the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest's, so is the trespass offering, it is most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. Pretty detailed, right? See how detailed God is with his law. He means it. It's not to be toyed with. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And of the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot upon the blood of the trespass offering. And the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed. And the priest shall make an ointment, or I mean an atonement for him before the Lord. That's a, an atonement, you know, a payment. Well, he's cleansed, though. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if he doesn't have his if he doesn't have his toes restored, he's not cleansed. This is for one who's cleansed. This, Right, so if they don't have a toe and a thumb, what's your conclusion? They're not cleansed. So this wouldn't apply to them. And this also lends itself to this healing of Jesus. It was an advanced case. He'd probably lost fingers and toes, but now Jesus has restored the fingers and the toes. It's a miracle. Uh, this... This wasn't a mild case that came to Jesus, we're told by Luke. Uh, this was an advanced case, so he'd probably lost some members. But now those are restored miraculously, so this can happen. But again, it, it all goes back to if you still, you're not cleansed, once the th things start falling off and can't be restored, you'll never be cleansed. You'll never be clean. That's, that's the point. That's why God used that example. Now, he didn't use many examples. There's only like one or two examples of Jesus healing a leper. But this one was an advanced case. He didn't just bring a mild case to Jesus. He wanted to show, no, this was a miracle of God, that, that his lost members were restored. Not only was his skin uh, restored, but then he lost fingers, toes, or whatever was restored. So to show that it was definitely a miracle. This is not uh, something you could argue away or explain away. Uh, 
That's right, yeah. Uh, the Bible speaks of the leprosy of sin. Uh, it, it, lepro- leprosy is kind of like our sin, and then there's a lot of similarities. And you could all say we all have an advanced case of it, too, that only Jesus can heal. And when we are healed, what should we do? Should we just go home and go on with our normal lives? No, it changes our whole life. And uh, first and foremost, we now start striving to obey the law of God, which we didn't do before. That's part of the repentance of faith. Where did I leave off here? That's right. Yeah, it isn't. It isn't a uh, a quickie. Yeah. Well, I went forward thirty years ago, and I'm. That's it. Yeah. Did I read nineteen? Okay, I read eighteen. Okay, nineteen. And the priest shall offer the sin offering, and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed from his uncleanness, and afterward he shall kill the burnt offering. Show us that all of our sicknesses, all of our problems in life, are, are, are due to what? Sin. Yeah. So he's bringing sin into this, even though it's leprosy. It's all connected. Verse 20, And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the meat offering upon the altar, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and he shall be clean. And if he be poor and cannot get so much as these animals and so forth, then he shall take one lamb for a trespass offering to be waived to make an atonement for him, and one-tenth deal of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering and a log of oil, and two turtle doves or two young pigeons such as he is able to get, and the one shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. And he shall bring them on the eighth day for his cleansing unto the priest, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Even a poor man has something. That's what he's saying. You have something to uh, fulfill this law of God. No man can say, well, I'm too poor. I can't afford my my lamb. I can't afford uh, some of my my flour. You know, I'm too poor. No, no, no. No man can say, I am, I'm immune to the law of God. It doesn't apply to me in my special circumstances. Uh, for 24, And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord, and he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering, And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot. Now, this offering is to do what? The lamb represents who? The the coming Messiah, Christ Jesus. And it is killed and the blood is put on the person. That's to remind him of his coming sin bearer, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, cleanses us with his blood. 26. And the priest shall pour of the oil into the palm of his own left hand, and the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. What's the oil represent? Sprinkling the oil. That's the anointing being chosen of God. Now you're in a new position. You have, you have a new role in life. You have a changed life. That's when you become a Christian. That's baptism. Okay. You're a new person now. You're not the same person you were before. Faith has changed you. The priest shall put of the oil that is in his hand upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of the right foot uh, upon the place of the blood of the trespass offering. 
And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand he shall put upon the head of him that is to be cleansed to make an atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer the one of the turtle doves or of the young pigeons such as he can get, even such as he is able to get, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Now what's the difference between a sin offering and a burnt offering, do you think? We've talked about the sin offering. It represents the coming Savior. But what's the burnt offering supposed to do? Well, it represents thanksgiving to God. Here's my offering to God. I'm giving of what he has given me back as a thank offering for him cleansing me. Okay. I'm sacrificing something I own as a thanks to him. Okay, so the burnt offering is the thank offering. That's something else a person does when they come to faith, right? They not only strive to live a God-pleasing life, but they also live a life of thanksgiving to God for the salvation he has procured for them. Uh, okay, so that's uh, 31. Even such as he is able to get the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, with the meat offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed before the Lord. We're out of time, but you can see this goes on. All the way to the end of chapter 14, two full chapters of the Bible. But it's full of symbolism, too. It's full of meaning, even though it seems tedious. But you can see how God is very, very uh, precise in his law. It's not just a general, I'll just go out there and be good, and so forth. He, he looks at every little detail of our life, every deed, every word, and every thought. It must be perfectly in line with his word, or it is sin. We should strive to be sinless, as Jesus said to the sinful woman that he forgave, go and sin no more. But this is how detailed we should be in our life, not just in general, well, God just wants me to go out there and... Uh, Think up my own laws. No. Now we, we look in his word and strive to obey his laws as best we can, and even in detail. Shall we close with the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.